So uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, Vint alluded in his presentation uh, to the fact that there are lots of terrestrial use cases uh, for DTN in constrained network environments. So Maria Uden, who is a DTN researcher in Sweden, is going to give us a pretty interesting presentation on how DTN has uh, enabled uh, communications with remote communities in uh, Sweden. Oh, I think it's as best that you help me with this now that we are. To the desktop and it's sometimes not intuitive. Yeah. And uh, middle age sucks. I left my glasses. Uh, let's go. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so hi everyone and uh, thank you very much uh, to Michael Snell and the Special Interests Group for inviting me here. Um, do you hear my voice well? And um, I will talk about something which is my main interest as a researcher, and that's um, well, technology and innovation and the topic of um, cultural diversity, you know, together, mixed. Um, I work at a place called Luleå University of Technology, and uh, that's the geographical position. It's uh, slightly south of the Arctic Circle in Sweden. Um, yeah, and here you see, uh, well, myself, and also uh, closer to the camera is um, Mr. Fritz Åke Kuljok, who is a reindeer herder and who has worked as a technician and manager also for us very much in, in throughout the process where uh, we have implemented uh, DTN tests in real life situations. Um, yeah, and I should say also that uh, Lulu University of Technology was inaugurated in 1973, so it's fairly new. And the north in Sweden is pretty much like the north in North America. So it's more sparsely populated and what the sociologists and the anthropologists tend to call remote and yeah and also the, the name Luleå University it's come it comes from the place called Luleå uh, by the Gulf of Botnia uh, where it's situated it's um, a, a town and uh, the name of the town Luleå comes from the river Luleå that has its outlets it runs from mountains in northwest to the Gulf of Bosnia in southeast. Um, and that has some kind of importance here. And, <laughs> well, uh, to kind of create some, some links to something people might know who are here, I, I just um, thought I could, I could mention two of our honorary doctors uh, at LTU. Lulu University of Technology, and this is, of course, Vint Cerf, who was, um, who became an honorary doctor with us in 1998, as I saw in the register, I hope they are correct. And um, this picture is from 2005, when he visited uh, with us in the DTN project. And also, some of you might see that uh, this other uh, person, this is uh, Stina Honkama, who uh, until recently was the country director for Sweden, uh, for Google in Sweden. So, it's supposed to be a pedagogical uh, <laughs> tool to, to create links, and um, well, I hope. <laughs> Uh, you will remember our university through these links. Um, 
Well, when I first heard about DTN, um, I worked with some women in a reindeer herder <coughs> husbandry community up along the Luleå River. Uh, they run an uh, affirmative action project for the women in the community and the goal was to better the possibilities for women to work as reindeer herders and run businesses within the traditional community. And reindeer husbandry is pretty much like information technology, like it's fairly male dominated and yeah. Uh, the, the picture is very much the same um, and it's a very important um, for the possibilities to re remain in the traditional community uh, to have um, a strong link to the husbandry industry so therefore it is vital uh, for, for the cultural um, um, well, for the diversity aspect, so that the traditional culture can remain, that the women can also have a chance to remain in the tradition uh, of reindeer husbandry. Uh, so it's not just about getting a job, it's about remaining uh, who you are and who you have been um, brought up to be. Um, and reindeer husbandry in this community, um, like you have reindeer husbandry all over Siberia and so forth and in northern Sc Scandinavia. So it, it's run a bit different in different places. But in this com community, uh, uh, the reindeer are herded between the coast where they can be in the winter and the high mountains where they are in the summer because it's... Uh, well, it's naturally the best uh, circumstances or conditions for the reindeer. And so the, the community is what one would say semi-nomadic with an anthropological term, um, or at least has been. Because modern life makes that, for instance, children, of course, had to go to school. So, you know, things change step by step. And this is uh, something that we'll, I will talk about um, more throughout this presentation. And this picture is taken um, high up in the mountains uh, above the tree line. So that's why it uh, appears all white and smooth. It's like a, a snow covered lake, but it's actually uh, up in the mountains. <laughs> so, well, I, uh, when I worked with these um, reindeer herders, um, one of the most frequent uh, themes that came up in the talks about how, how to better the conditions and how, how to make uh, husbandry more uh, of a realistic um, proposition uh, for a life career for women and men, of course, of course uh, was the snowmobile. And I think to, to explain why DTN then is a matter of cultural diversity, I start with talking about the snowmobile, which represent the current uh, technological paradigm, and, you know, to, to explain why, why it is not enough and something else is needed. Let's see. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the snowmobile problem then. Uh, first of all, we worked in a transdisciplinary mood, so we were interested in both the social aspects like attitudes and, and the saying went that uh, women cannot be reindeer herders because the snowmobile is too heavy for them. And so, um, you know, th that was a, a common explanation in the community and also among um, people who work in, in the authorities uh, with um, uh, an oversight over the reindeer husbandry. Um, and then 
Um, in fact, the snowmobile is very heavy and it's too heavy for everyone, to be <laughs> honest, because it's, um, uh, uh, there are lots of damages and you know, throughout life uh, one, one gets quite um, mm -mm, hurt by it in the long run. Uh, so we discussed all these things together and, you know, tried the women in the community group. They tried to come up with uh, different solutions. How do we go about this no mobile problem? So education in driving and maintenance or physical training to become stronger or, you know, low-tech solutions go back to skiing and so on and so forth. Uh, and in these pictures you see some of the different things one might do, uh, transportation of snow mobiles, and um, filling up gas uh, when reaching the overnight destination, and of course just driving around. Um, and also, I thought that um, the audience would probably be interested to see the snow mobile in use, so this is what we are talking about. Herding animals is about moving them from one place to another or keeping them in the place where they are supposed to be, where the conditions are most favorable. So this is one of possible scenes. Uh, and then, even though, you know, we talked about the snowmobile as a problem, obviously, without the snowmobile, Reindeer husbandry would not be realistic at all since 1970s, 80s, definitely. And this picture is from about 1940. It's from a family photo album. And it shows um, a period of change. Uh, you see the reindeer uh, mm, pull the sleigh. Is that the correct English? Yeah. And, 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 but the sleigh goes uh, on the road. So the roads are entering the area kind of earlier. They would you know, go on, on snow, obviously, and have this round shape. Um, so, uh, and uh, of course, yeah, this, this wouldn't be feasible at all. Transporting equipment, people, and this and that with the reindeer uh, today, everything, the pace is faster for everything and there's more, there are more things happening in the husbandry areas too. So, um, so the snowmobile is necessary. People have to invest in the snowmobile, they have to keep it in shape, the maintenance has to be done, they have to buy the fuel, pay for the fuel, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it uh, allows uh, people to live in the pace of the present time, and it allows people to, uh, you know, place a family in one uh, larger village or town and the reindeer herder would go back and forth and back and forth from uh, the locations of, of the animals. Um, yeah, but th that's, that's what it, the snowball mobile can do. It enables uh, people to do things faster. It, it doesn't really solve any of the conflicts between living on the one hand a modern life with school and maybe for the spouse, a gainful employment, and then the reindeer herder who needs to, um, to be um, at the position where the reindeer are in the forest or in the mountains and so forth. And this, um, this split also affects um, the traditional learning and, and passing on the traditional knowledge about husbandry because of course, if the children are located where they, they stay where they can go to school, which necessarily everybody, uh, they want to do, and the many, many of the reindeer herders have um, 
families with high education and so forth to, to be a part of the normal society. But in, in any case, it means that there is a split. So the culture is not really necessarily brought further to the next generations. Uh, so there are costs for the snowmobile and uh, it enables some, some things to be done uh, quicker, but uh, things basically remain the same. And then, <laughs> come to DTN. Um, Avri Doria, who is an American internet architect, um, was a guest researcher at LTU in the early 2000s. And she and um, Anders Lindgren, who was then a PhD student, um, presented to us this idea about using DTN for creating um, <coughs> connectivity and, and networks. Hmm. Okay, with this new delay tolerant networking regime. And, and this opened a totally different horizon from where we used to work with, you know, the problem of how to solve the snow mobile solution, where, where the technology was the center of attention and, and you know, what had needed to be solved. Um, the, the idea of having access to the communication that the internet and other networks uh, provide and uh, all the information and all the people one can reach and, and you know, everything. Um, distance education, business contacts, everything that earlier were available only in the village centers or, or the towns would potentially be available also from the herding districts. And this could make kind of uh, a whole, again, of the culture. Uh, at least, um, at least one could um, have this ambition. And well, uh, I wrote here even from a mountain top, and that's because, um, I mean, the, this cap capacity of information and communication technology to to uh, bridge over time and space is, of course, not new. When we, when we heard about DTN, it, it was well known in, in, at large, globally, and among the reindeer herders as well. But uh, you know, the, this um, way of talking about um, ICTs and mobile uh, um, access and so forth, uh, people say like, well, these days, even from a mountain top, we can communicate. And um, first and foremost, who lives on a mountain top? Perhaps where it's warmer, people can do that, but certainly not in, in the subarctic and Arctic climate. We don't live in the mountain tops. And, and uh, also, this about uh, you know total access throughout everywhere in uh, over the map, the global map. It's not really true. You know, there is access in in uh, more urban areas and in population centers and along larger roads and in airports and so forth. Uh, but for natural reasons, uh, reindeer husbandry takes place where there are few people <laughs> and ideally also very little infrastructure because they are animals, they, they tend to be, to, to uh, live better in nature than among uh, masts and, and uh, things like that. Uh, so, so therefore, the suggestion of DTN that Avri Doria and Anders Lindgren presented to us, which was about peer-to-peer uh, -peer communications, uh, using data mules to physically transport um, um, traffic, uh, seemed like you know, it, it could create a common ground for a shared society with uh, different cultures 
getting together and, and that this time and space bridging capacity would be possible to arrange without heavy investments in infrastructure and so forth. That would, yeah, I'll go further. <laughs> yeah. No? I think, mm -mm -mm, perhaps, yeah, uh, the order was mixed. So this is, I mean, just to illustrate the mountaintop principle and everybody knows it. If you climb up, you might get connectivity. Um, and this picture is from the first uh, real life test that we made in 2006 um, in the Pajelanta National Park and uh, uh, where we tested the DTN um, using the profit um, algorithm that Anders Lindgren um, was, had developed with some other people. And this test was organized together with the women who led the affirmative action, which the whole process started with. So we were part of the community, like not a military boot camp, you know, coming in and, but, but really with the community, uh, which makes a um, big difference, obviously, uh, for, for this. And yeah, and this is from the same real life test. This is one of the young uh, master students who, who participated, Matthias Ek, and he shows, you know, you can send emails shows to some of the kids in, in the mountain, the summer camp, the Sami summer camp. And one of the kids is also uh, my son, uh, he who looks towards you. That's my son, Hugo. Um, I brought him with me. Mm. So one can easily imagine no. Everything you know about how to create business and how to create social networks and everything, one can imagine how much it could mean for a community that really needs to live in another place than most people and in another type of, um, let's say, time um, zone, because it's the time zone of nature which is not the same as the, the clock and the calendar and so forth. So everything you can create for making business or, uh, you know, could be even more um, fruitful for this kind of a traditional community than it is for us who anyhow have, you know, access to lots of people and, you know, e easily interact and, and get information from different sources that are even physically available. I mean, old style library, for instance, if that's what we need. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I'm approaching the end of my presentation here, so uh, we made, um, we did tests with one project called SNC 2006 and 2007, summer and winter, summer were bigger tests, and, and in a project called N4C that was funded by the EU7 uh, framework project, we did tests uh, 2008 through 2011. And then it was not only Sweden, but uh, other places in Europe as well. And uh, as the two main results I would like to mention here is, of course, the profit RFC, where Anders Lindgren is the main author, which is about dynamic routing, perhaps one could say, for DTN. And the NSIM, which means not so instant messaging uh, platform for um, applications and services that Samu Grausic developed. And on the picture you see Samu 
uh, at the time uh, a master student and I would say um, well he's now a PhD student with us and, and will um, finish his studies quite soon present his thesis and Samo to us I would say would be something like our Scott Burley I think if, if a comparison is possible he, uh, he has really done things um, made them real so to speak um, and I also want to mention that our partner in the um, N4C European project MACE they have run DTN continuously since uh, 2000 and in Slovenia and they monitor weather and you know climate and pollution and things like that and uh, you can look at our web page n4c.eu and I wrote a summary in the Journal of Community Informatics which was published in 2012 I believe and yeah uh, the women who run the who managed the affirmative action project um, Karin Kolejok and Susanne Speak, uh, reindeer herders, both of them, and business owners. They are, of course, interested in making business. Uh, so they they have started. Uh, they have a startup, which you know they have been running for a while now, and try to get going, uh, which is about um, animal tracking, reindeer tracking, um, of course. Um, and I sh these pictures just show Karin using the binoculars. W one of the obvious things one wants to do is to keep track of where one's animals are. And possibly with uh, distance spanning technologies, we can uh, decrease uh, the use of snowmobiles and things like that, that, you know, have costs and also, of course, burn fuel which is not ecologically uh, ideal. And um, yeah, and I also want to mention that uh, at least some of those very nice pictures that you have seen were taken by a photographer, Lena Kuljok Lind, who is also a member of this um, reindeer husbandry community. And this was um, as a documentation of the uh, women reindeer herders working life throughout um, the year. Yeah, and this is, yeah. I think that was what I wanted to say. I hope you have understood something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we, we, we had in the, these um, uh, mountain areas, the summer lands of, of these reindeer herders, uh, the LTU, the last summer um, major test that LTU made was in the summer of 2010. And then Stephen Farrell and his uh, crew uh, did something more in 2011 with the same community. And, uh, you know, we don't leave equipment there. The, the whole idea about the, the network design is that one should be able to put it up and pack it and bring it along when one goes, So because it should be nomadic, so to speak. So we don't run it now, we hope to, but in Slovenia, which uh, where there is totally other climate and also totally other business um, circumstances uh, for this company, MACE, who are doing uh, monitoring of climate uh, and pollutions. So they, they have been running continuously since uh, 2008. And you know, they've done things in, in caves and, and cave systems and so forth, climate watching, yeah. So Maria, could you describe you know, what a typical 
you know, data mule was for this mm. test project? Yeah. In, in the first uh, tests that we made in 2006, the typical data mule was uh, the young man you saw in the picture earlier, <laughs> namely Matthias Ek, who walked with a backpack uh, with a laptop um, from the camp to where they had put a temporary um, radio mast that uh, sent to, uh, across a big lake to where there was a possibility to have um, a, um, what they call, when they fall, uh, you know, I forget words. When you call, when you call on the telephone, what's it called again? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> modem, modem, ah, yeah, okay. yeah, and they did, you know, call. It was it was calling regularly to, and so forth, the internet, and and so that was it. And um, in the period, to, and, and cars have been used also for winter tests. And 2008 to 2010, when we made our and did our N4C for C tests, uh, actually helicopters were used. Because there are some, uh, this is a national park, but uh, there are regular helicopter tours for fetching fish and so forth, and then, you know, with where the tourists can go and, uh, into the mountains. And, and so the helicopters were data mules during that time. And I would say, uh, I'm not so happy about the helicopters. <laughs> Everybody loved them because they can go fast and then you get a lot of data. But uh, anyhow, I would like to see more like whatever boats, the small boats that the uh, fishers uh, use and, and more walking around and, and things like that. Uh, it has advantages with the helicopter, but it also has certain shortcomings uh, well, but that's the negotiation between you want to have a lot of data and you want things to go fast, and there they are, and and then uh, these other more kind of maybe science fiction <laughs> visions that I have about this kind of a system. So, mm. uh, Maria, I wanted to thank you. This was very. Uh, uh, I think uh, eye-opening in a very technology mm -hmm. conference. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate it because uh, that's in one of areas of my interest. Even though uh, technology is very exciting, but the end should be for uh, betterment of human life, no matter where they live. So the, all the advances in the technology, no matter uh, all the challenges we see, and it was described in the previous few sessions, and overcoming as the problem we want to solve, it's so good to see here the problem is not just the technology requirement, but how to introduce it to human life and the communities for their betterment as opposed to unbalance it. So I really like this and I do see the challenges you described here. Uh, it's, a, it's a template of the challenges I see in many other remote or communities uh, around the world. So I wanted to thank you for that. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to hear. Thank you. And yeah, um, I am actually an engineer as a background, but not at all with the information communication technologies. So I'm working with the transdisciplinary things here. But uh, I mean, the, the ambition is to be able to develop technology that really supports cultural diversity. That's my motive for being engaged in DTN. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, is there is there in the women's group that you were working with? Mm -hmm. Is there an aspect of the ecological concerns you mentioned? The snowmobiles were not the most ecological thing, but was that part of the discussion that that yeah. DTN is also addressing? Do you think? Uh, well, yes, there are ecological concerns, and um, for many reasons and. You know, one difference between being an engineer and being a reindeer herder is if you're a reindeer herder, you're dependent on the state of nature in, in the area where you reside and, and where your animals uh, 
grace. As an engineer, I can move back and forth between different places and, you know, and, and do my job it, because engineering is about changing uh, reality. Um, so the, the women are, of course, um, who are engaged in the affirmative action are, of course, very um, aware of different types of degradation and threats. And I would say generally the reindeer husbandry community has uh, represents that kind of um, awareness. Um, and then of course we are all members of the same global society these days. And um, you know, so, so one, one cannot say I will be so totally ecologically correct that I will never use a car or a snowmobile or anything more because that would kind of uh, take away the economical basis of, of your life and your family's lives and yeah. Yeah. I thank you for the uh, presentation. I enjoyed it as well. So what type of support or technologies would probably have the biggest positive influence on you continuing this wonderful work you're doing. What kind of support would you need in the future going forward? Yeah. Well, um, my favorite project would be to be able to continue uh, together with, um, with this community and, and engage people in, in uh, actually, you know, setting up the network and, and, and learn to run it. Because I think we have developed a fairly, you know, stable technology. So, you know, youth, uh, camps for youth in the hus reindeer husbandry communities all over Scandinavia, that would be great. Uh, so that they could uh, learn to use this and put it up um, themselves. That kind of thing would be, you know, my my favorite project at the time. To... So, <laughs> um, equipment and of course uh, the possibility to uh, to uh, hire the teachers, or if there are voluntary teachers around, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I didn't really hear. If I've used. Uh huh. Uh, no, not telephone calls because we really are talking about, um, you know, delays here. I mean, so, so you cannot have have the continuous conversation. Uh, Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, didn't. The first problem you have is that there are 65 degrees north or worse, and so satellite communication is very difficult because it's right on the horizon. Although I suppose if we could get some laser links like uh, we heard about, that might help. So that's a big problem is connectivity. Uh, when we hear about the Loon project later today, that's one conceivable um, solution, although it's only been tested in the southern hemisphere and not the northern, uh, and that's using stratospheric balloons to provide this kind of connectivity. But the reason that the DTN is interesting uh, in the current uh, experiments is exactly that the connectivity was intermittent and not necessarily predictable, and so the tolerance of the protocol to that uh, disruption was actually attractive. Uh, I, w I think that we should uh, explore offline uh, what it would take to get a uh, continuously operating uh, DTN network in at least one community and see what would happen over a period of time uh, to how they would use it and whether in fact it helped to solve some of the problems of maintaining the lifestyle while at the same time allowing connectivity that both the children and the families need. 
So that will be an exciting thing to scope out and see if it could be made more than just a technical experiment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we're running close to noontime, aren't we? So maybe we have to stop there. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much, you. Maria.